All right, people, we have a, a slight change of our theme. What we're going to do, we're going to close our series in Psalms right now, and we're going to be journeying into a theme that I hope to set for you today. Some of you will have heard this before in different shapes and in different forms, but I'm going to incorporate it into one overview of where we as preachers are going to be hoping to lead you over the course of the next number of weeks. Now, if you take this beautiful book here and you open it to the exact middle of the book, you will probably turn it to the book of Psalms. Now, that's what we've been focusing on for the last period of time. And uh, we started with Psalm 1, which is always a good place to finish. And we want to finish the series in Psalm 2 because it is a great way of encapsulating and incorporating the mission that we want to take you on for the theme for the next few weeks. Now, this psalm is a, is a beautiful psalm. It's a psalm of, of deep emotion, as are all the psalms. The psalms are born out of pain. The psalms are born out of suffering. The psalms are born out of the joy that God brings. The psalms are born out of bitter disappointment and, and suffering in life and confusion. And yet, at the same time, the psalms are born out of incredible peace. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lay down in green parts. It's a, it covers every human emotion to in a great, a really huge extent. It's songs from the heart. Now, I need to paint a picture for you as we start this today because there's a category of psalms that we call messianic psalms. These are psalms that speak about Jesus long before he was born. These are psalms that point to Jesus as being the Messiah, and he's the one who will come and save the nation and save the world ultimately. It's all about Jesus. Every one of them points to Jesus. But this one is very specific in the terminology of who the Messiah is. I want to take you, first of all, I'm just going to take you to the verse that I want to talk about. It says in verse 12, kiss the Son. He's talking about, Jesus hasn't even been born yet. This is David speaking. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry with you. It's prophetic of the time that Jesus will come, and he will reveal himself as the Messiah to mankind. Psalm 2 is called for me the kiss. And this is the theme that we're going to be journeying through over the course of the next number of weeks. I had an interesting week, and I, I know I spoke about this stuff some time back years ago, but it, you know how you always end up where you begin, and, and I came back to this beautiful theme, and as I studied this theme yesterday, I was encouraged to think that there are many applications of the kiss as we see in Scripture. And funnily enough, each one of them speaks into a different phase or a different situation in our Christian experience. And I want to take you through nine of them very quickly today to set the scene of what we're going to be doing. The kiss is what this is all about. And I was amazed to see how many times it's mentioned in Scripture, and every time it's mentioned, it's part of our spiritual journey. So for the next period of time, we're going to be talking about the kiss, and I hope that it'll be beneficial to you, man. The kiss. Psalm 1, Psalm 2, sorry, has a, starts off with an incredibly dramatic scene. Now let me set the scene and then I'll read the passage. It's a courtroom scene. It's a courtroom scene and it's very dramatic. And in the dark is God. And everybody is standing, the world is standing and they're trying to, trying to badmouth God. You know, they're trying to tell him that he's irrelevant. They're trying to tell him that he doesn't exist. And all the kings of the world have gathered to testify about God or who they suppose God could be or would be or should be or is not, according to them. And so we have all these people who conspire against God. It says the nations rise and the people plot in vain. It's a very dramatic scene. The kings of the earth have taken their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and His anointed. Who's the anointed? It's Jesus. And then this picture goes on. All the witnesses are called. And if we were to do this courtroom drama today, we'd have Mao Zedong in the corner and he would say, God is dead. He would leave the dock, and then Voltaire would come up and say, not only is dead, but he never was. And then Karl Marx would stand up and say, hey, God is not God, we are God. And then you would have someone like all the cynics and the skeptics and the academics, and at best, all they could conclude is if God does exist, he is irrelevant to us today. And then they would stand back after mouthing their mouths off 
and they would say, we rest our case, let's take a vote. And the world in the main would vote to say, we go with you guys. We go with you guys. And they, for some stupid reason, think that they have won and that their intellectual capacity will determine God's existence or God's non-existence. And then suddenly, the scene changes. I'll read it to you in a moment. Without a word, silence falls across the courtroom. The eyes of the people widen. Their mouths <laughs> drop open. The walls begin to shake. And the mountains outside begin to crumble and the kings fall off their throne, and the lightning flashes, and the darkness descends, and they cover their ears because there is a sound that is terrifying to them. And you know what the sound is? It's the sound of God laughing at them. God laughs at them. And everything that they have said of God, God says, do you really think that your scientific opinion is going to determine whether I exist or not? Do you really think that your application of logic and, and mathematics is going to determine that I exist or not? And he laughs at that. And God laughs, and the world trembles. And then verse 10, there onwards, is a response to who this God is. And we'll talk about this as... This is big deal stuff. Here I go. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against His anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. Then the one enthroned in heaven laughs and the Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and he terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. That's a prophetic word about Jesus. Then down to verse 10. Therefore, you kings, in light of what you've just heard and seen, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are those who take refuge in, in him. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with you. I guess if I would have just put this sermon into a capsule, I'd say, you don't want to mess with God. <laughs> you don't want to mess with him. You don't want to mess with his ways. You don't want to mess with his words because they are perfect. Don't try and make it better because you think you're wise. You don't want to mess with a holy God. And we see kiss the sun. The kiss is a picture of many things. Let me take you through a few of them. First of all, let's talk about the magic of a kiss. You know, if you watch some music movies and you watch Snow White, and mwah, kisses her and She's going to make life again, you know. You get the, the kiss of, of beauty and the beast, and this ugly monster becomes, and she kisses the beast. Oh, don't kiss the beast. He's so ugly. But she kisses the beast, and mwah, all of a sudden he becomes a handsome prince. Have you seen the movies about kissing a frog? If you girls are looking for a husband, you know what to do. You know what to do, hey. You find the biggest, ugliest, grotesque frog, and you kiss that sucker, and, and you will find for yourself, a, and ask Helene, that's what she did, and, and you see the result of kissing the frog, the, the kiss, the magic of a kiss, but today's sermon, there are nine other kisses that I, I want to take you through in anticipation of this journey of kisses that we're going to go through. First of all, I want to talk to you about, we've spoken about the kiss. Okay, here we go. I'm going back to my noughts and crosses sign because there are nine very quick aspects that set the scene for where we are going. The first kiss that I want to talk about is the kiss of life. You know, in the Garden of Eden, God made man out of the dust of the world and he, he eventually clothed them and he put stuff on them and, uh, and he kissed life into these people. At once they were just dust. And God, out of the dust of the ground, he, he shaped a man. And then it says, and then he breathed his life. And it's like the kiss of life. 
That's where it begins, the kiss of life. It ends with the kiss of life of death. That's what we talk about in the course of our lives. And so between the kiss of life and the kiss of death, and death is not an ugly thing, it's like God kissing you into eternity. It's an act of deep affection as God takes you from this world into the life that is to come. But between the kiss of life from the Garden of Eden to the kiss of death, there's a whole bunch of other kisses that we're going to have a look at. In uh, chapter 2, verse 7, God kissed and we breathed life into the dust And verse 7 apparently says what it does. It says, And man became a living being. Man stood up and he became a living being. Sadly, in the Garden of Eden it didn't go well. And man rebelled against God and decided he wanted independence from God. And so there was a distance created between God and man. It was a thing called sin that came between God and man. And now they were in two separate worlds almost. And so God initiated the kiss of reconciliation that took place at the cross. Notice who's initiating the kiss. The second kiss is this kiss of, of kiss and makeup. You know when you, you fight with somebody or you argue with somebody or your wife or your kid or something, and then you, you as it were, you kiss and make up, and everything that has been hurtful has been left behind because of the emotion of the wonder of reconciliation that happens at the point of humility and the point of reconciliation is a kiss of this beautiful thing we call reconciliation. Genesis chapter 33 has a whole bunch of them. First of all, we have Genesis 33 with Jacob and Esau. Jacob had ripped off Esau and lived with a guilty conscience for many, many years until he said, I need to make up with my brother. And you read in verse 30, chapter 33 how Jacob found his brother. And after wrestling with God, he found his brother. He thought his brother was going to curse him, but he, brother, kissed him. After all that pain, after all that suffering, They kissed one another, and it was like they had been united all of the the time. It was a kiss of reconciliation. Genesis 45, we have another one, with Joseph. Joseph, who was rejected by his brothers and sold as a slave. And he went, into, he went to Egypt and he became a, a servant. And, and then he became a, ultimately became the prime minister. And one day his 12 brothers came back into the land. He recognized them and he could have put them all to death. But instead it says he wept and he kissed his brothers. What kind of kiss was that? It was a kiss of forgiveness It was a kiss of reconciliation. And as a result of that kiss, he said to his brothers, I want to give you the best of the land. Choose where you want to live. Because when we do that by way of reconciliation, that's the outcome, is a better one than it was before. And so the kiss of reconciliation. And then for me, the most beautiful of all is the prodigal returning home. And his father, who has been waiting for him, sees his son coming down the road. And he's so overjoyed, he runs and he embraces his son. And the son is not expecting this. The son is expecting his father's going to hit him or beat him or, or, or do something to him. But the, the father is so overwhelmed, he embraces the son and he kisses him. And the son is looking saying, what is that all about? And the father says, I'm so glad you're home. Kill the fatted calf, put a beautiful robe on him, put a ring on his finger. And that kiss is the kiss of reconciliation. Isn't it beautiful that here we are, 2022, we look back to 2,000 something years ago and we remember the kiss of reconciliation that took place at the cross. Psalm 85 puts it like this, verse 10. Love and kindness meet together. Righteousness and peace have kissed one another. That's the cross. Righteousness, of which we have none, and peace, of which we have even less, have kissed one another at the cross. Who initiated that? Did we? Not at all. Did God? Totally. Totally. God said, let's be reconciled. And this is where it happens. The third kiss I want to talk about is the kiss of separation. Thanks, Heather, for your help with my my drawings here. Okay, that is a fire. Okay, this is wood. You can bring your marshmallows. It's the kiss 
of saying goodbye. Let me, it's a kiss of separation. 1 Kings 19 has, speaks of this kind of kiss. Elisha has been called by Elijah to be his succession plan. And Elisha says, yep, I'll do it. But he says, I have to do something first. I have to kiss my parents goodbye. If I'm going to follow you, Elijah, and I'm going to do everything that you need me to do, and if I'm going to be a servant that is totally at your women, your fancy, and your command, I need to kiss my parents behind. I need to kiss my past behind. I need to kiss that plow behind that I was plowing in the land. I need to kiss my cows behind, but, uh, uh, leave them behind me. I have to leave the past behind. I'm going to tell people, that I can't wait to preach this one. Because when we kiss the past behind, it refrees us up for a future that God is able to use us. Kind of like the children of Israel, when they left the Egypt and they went across the Red Sea into the wilderness, they just couldn't kiss Egypt goodbye. They were always as a stiff-necked people looking back to Egypt, saying, man, we had food there, we had meat there, we had, at, least we had, at least we had stuff there. Moses, in the wilderness, we've got nothing, nothing but God. And God is everything. And they kept looking behind them. They just couldn't burn those bridges. No turning back. I love that song. We need to sing it. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, and this is the direction that I have burned with the past. Sometimes think that the past has too much control over us. And the children of Israel would be a great example of that. So we need to burn up the past. We need to get rid of those things as Elisha did. He burnt his, his, his potential to make income. He burnt his, his inheritance. He burnt everything. And he says, now I'm ready to follow you, Elijah. You've got to travel really light as a Christian. The lighter you travel, the better the journey is going to be. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we have this, uh, this kiss here. And the only way I can depict it is the kiss, kiss of the feigned affection. You know, we often see the heart as being the source of affection. But then we, when, we are, when we have the kiss of feigned affection, we, we think about, we, we'll, we'll be kind to you, and we'll give you a half-hearted kiss because we want something from you. Now, if you look again at the story of Jacob and Esau, Genesis chapter 20, and it's, a, it's an incredible story about Jacob stole Esau's birthright. And then Esau was out hunting, and Jacob went to, to, to his father Isaac under the help of his mother, and he, the one was a hairy guy. Esau was a hairy guy, and Jacob is a very smooth-skinned guy. And so his mom says, don't worry about the hairy stuff and the smell stuff. We're going to put some skin on you so that when you go to see your dad, your dad, who is almost totally blind, is going to want to feel you. He's going to want to smell you. So when you come and ask him for the inheritance of Esau, go and read the story. Go and read the story. Yeah, then he, he will think that he's, you're conning him. It's the kiss of feigned affection. And we read in Genesis chapter 27, verse 26, where Esau says, My son, come, let me kiss you. And Jacob smiles because he's conned his dad. And that kiss he gave his father was the kiss of feigned affection. Now, you know, you say, well, how does that relate to me? Those of you who have been in this church for any length of time will know we often talk about being fans of Jesus and followers of Jesus. Fans of Jesus are people who kiss with feigned affection. They just want something from him. So they give him a little bit of affection and think, well, that'll cover it because they're just fans. Jesus had lots and lots of fans. And they would applaud him and they would shout for him and they would cheer for him. But when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, all the fans left and only the followers remained. You see, the fans of Jesus are those who kiss with feigned affection, like Jacob who just wanted something from his father. So he just went, all right, there you go. Now can I have what I want? We're going to talk a lot about that. And then number five, we have this kiss of allegiance. This is the kiss of allegiance, where the cross has moved from there to you where you pledge allegiance to the cross of Christ. What is your allegiance to right now? 
I would suggest allegiance to any government is superficial compared to your allegiance to Christ. I would suggest that the allegiance to Him is to be allegiance that overwhelms every other one. In 1 Kings 19, Elijah now is depressed. He's had the victory on Mount Carmel. The queen has threatened to kill him. He runs into the wilderness and he sleeps. He wakes up and then God says to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And he says, oh Lord, you don't seem to understand. I'm the only one left. I'm the only one who has not bowed the knee to Baal. I'm the only one who continues to follow you. There's nobody else out there. And God must have smiled and said, oh Elijah, that's not true. And he says in verse 18, God says, There are yet 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not bowed, to, bowed down to Baal and all whose mouths have not kissed him. You see, God's demand is exclusive allegiance. He won't share your allegiance with somebody or something else. And God would want you to, to know that your allegiance needs to be completely to Him. He won't compete with other gods with small g's. There's a lot of things out there that are wanting to compete with God with a big g. You've got the small g God of materialism and says, why don't your allegiance lie in this? That's one. You've got the allegiance to different principles that the world suggests might be a good thing. Well, I didn't want to knock it too bad because there might be some good stuff amongst it. But people, God demands a complete allegiance. Now, I've got to tell you that allegiance like this can get you into a lot of trouble. Have a look at Scripture. Jesus is the ultimate example of his allegiance to the plan of God, his Father. Got him into a lot of trouble on earth. They took this man with great allegiance to the Father and they killed him. They hung him upon a cross. It got him into a lot of trouble. But when you look even at, at the story of Daniel and uh, in the lion's den, his commitment and his allegiance was to God and not to man. We look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his three young friends, and they were told, you're going to be thrown in the fire unless you commit allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar. They could not do, them, do that, so they threw them into the fire. Think of the martyrs at the time of just after Jesus, and the early church was beginning to develop, and the Romans of the day thought the only way we're going to get rid of Christians is to kill them. And so they were incredibly imaginative in how to kill Christians. And they would throw them to the lions, but every time before they threw them in, they would call them and say, we don't want to do this. You don't have to die like this. If you would just say, just whisper in my ear, Caesar is Lord, and we'll let you go back to your family. We'll let you go back to your workplace. No one will even know if you'll just say that to us. We will free you, and you don't have to die this miserable death. Come on, just whisper in my ear, Caesar is Lord. And the people could not do that. I'm sure some did. But the martyrs did not. They said, we cannot say that because Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. Don't make it a matter what you do to me, no matter what you do to anybody around me. I will never declare that somebody else is Lord when I know that Jesus is the Lord. Many thousands were thrown into fiery furnaces and crucified on crosses and put to death in the most horrible and grotesque ways because they declared allegiance to Jesus. Well, you say, well, that was back then. What about today? I've got to tell you, you need to talk to Rohan and Charlene, and they will tell you about persecution overseas to Christians. This is still the same thing. They're saying, just reject Jesus and follow our ways. Don't make us feel bad by talking about Jesus. And if you don't talk about Jesus, then you can live your life quite nicely. And these people are heroes, man. Absolute heroes. Where they'll say, you can do what you like to me. I will never not follow him because my flag is very clear to be seen. My allegiance is to Christ. We're going to talk about that as well. Let's move on to... The kiss of betrayal. The kiss of betrayal, you'll know where I'm going on this one. Luke chapter 22, we have uh, Judas, and he has gone out there and for 30 pieces of silver, he betrays Jesus with a kiss. Just 30 pieces of silver. 
Yeah. Man, it doesn't make any sense. He's been with Jesus for close on three years. He witnessed Jesus raising people from the dead. He's witnessed as Jesus has healed the blind and the deaf and made the lame walk. He has watched with his own eyes those things. He was probably there at the teaching of the Beatitudes. He was probably there when Jesus spoke all those amazing sermons and those incredible parables. And Judas may well have been sitting in the front row and people would have voted him if there was somebody who was primed for success. We had all pointed to Judas. He's a clever guy. He's handling the finance. He's a, he, but he's a traitor. And he betrays Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane that night after the Lord's Supper. And he has his final supper with his disciples. He goes across the Kidron Valley up to the, to the side of the hill of Gethsemane. And, and he goes off and he prays and his disciples fall asleep. He comes back three times. Then all of a sudden there's a huge noise and lights coming up the hill as Jesus, as Jesus is praying. And then he wakes his disciples up and he says, guys, it's, it's time. And they say, it's time for what? He says, it's time for the Son of Man to be betrayed through a kiss. And Judas steps out of the ranks and he kisses Jesus. That was a plan. 30 pieces of silver. Well, it's quite a lot of money in those days. But the trade-off, as he realized thereafter, was of no use to him at all. At the end of it, guilt was so ridden in his body that his mind that he takes the 30 pieces of silver back to the people he got it from at the temple. He throws it down on the floor and he says, I want a clear conscience. I cannot. I have betrayed the blood of an innocent man. And they said, well, you, we're not going to use that money because it was used for what are you use, we're planning to use it for. And Judas went out guilt ridden and he took his own life. Man. If that guy had only realized he could have come to Jesus and asked for forgiveness, and there's nothing that Jesus can't forgive. Even Judas, in the act of betrayal, Jesus could have forgiven him, but he just didn't do it because he says, I'm just too far gone. Jesus will never be able to forgive me. Oh, man, how sad. If you think you're there today, you need to understand no matter what you've done, where you've been, you know, it, it, Jesus is able to forgive anything if we come in repentance to Him. The last three I saved down here for the aspect of worship. Can't wait to get this theme. There are those people who worship with boldness. Just a big exclamation. <laughs> Wrong way around. <laughs> the exclamation dots at the top. No, it's not. <laughs> Got it right. Sorry. Exclamation mark. Yeah. <laughs> it's bold worship and an exclamation mark at the end of it. And there's a beautiful example, Luke chapter 7 from verse 36 to 39, where a sinful woman comes into the presence of Jesus. We think it was Mary Magdalene. And she goes into the presence of Jesus and she, she does the most beautiful thing. She pours perfume all over him, all over him. And then she kisses his feet. Beautiful act. But it was bold. You know why it was bold? Because there was opposition to her worship. There was a bunch of men standing there, probably with their arms folded like this, looking and said, what's she doing here? How does she get in here? This is a men's club meeting. What is this woman doing in here? She shouldn't be here. And they would have given her a hard time. They would have scolded her. They would have belittled her. So what do you want here? You're a woman, and you're a sinful woman. We know your reputation. We know what you've been doing. We know who you are. But with boldness, this incredibly brave woman walks into the presence of Jesus surrounded by, by misunderstanding men, and she makes her bold act of worship. And she pours perfume upon Jesus' feet. And she kisses his feet. A beautiful picture. There's an Old Testament picture of this. Because worship in, sometimes is, needs to be bold. But for most people, it's kind of convenient worship. I'll worship conveniently. You can't say I'm not worshiping. I am worshiping. But I'm not worshiping boldly, but I am worshiping conveniently. In Exodus chapter 33, it's beautiful. Moses has put up a tent. They call it the tent of meeting in the middle of the wilderness. 
And, 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 and Moses and Joshua would go down there to the tent of meeting and the cloud would descend and the fire would come down and everybody would say, man, that's Moses and Joshua. They are meeting with God. And then in, in verse, verse 48, sorry, in verse 10 of Exodus 33, at this tent of meeting it says this, but as for the people, they worshipped from the doors of their tents. It's convenient worship. Oh, Moses said they were meeting with God down there. But uh, you know, it's such a hassle, man. It's such a hassle to get down there. I've got kids and I've got responsibility. And my tent is looking a bit torn and shabby. I need to do something. And so they worship from a distance. That's not what bold worship is all about. Boldness of worship is not always convenient worship. And these people said, we'll worship God. but We'll worship Him on our terms. We'll worship him from a distance. We'll worship him when it's convenient. And let Moses and them do the thing down there. The we, we'll just stay at home and we'll worship God. And it's as it were, they are from a distance blowing kisses to God. Instead of getting there intimate with Mo, like Moses and Joshua, they're blowing, hey Moses, tell God we love him. Hey Moses, tell God we like him. Hey Moses, tell God thanks. Hey Moses, tell God we think he's great. They blow kisses from a distance. That's not bold worship, people. Bold worship. I can't wait to get this one. This is going to be such a cool theme to talk about. Bold worship is bold worship. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Number eight, so the subject of worship. Unfortunately, I've got to leave this one blank because there are some who don't worship at all. It, it's not that they're not doing other stuff. If you ever look at that same passage in Luke, let me just read it to you so you get it. If you look at Luke, <coughs> Luke, uh, this woman has come into the scene and she, she's kissed Jesus' feet, she's wiped his feet with her hair, and she's poured perfume on them. Okay, the host of the home, his name is Simon, he comes and says, Hey, Jesus. What's she doing in my house? And Jesus says she is worshiping. And he says, but, but why should she be here? And this is what Jesus said. He told him this. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay their debt back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now which of these will love him more? And Simon replied, mm, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. And Jesus says, you have judged correctly. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, Simon, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you that her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who has been given little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. This is kind of a picture of the guy who's so close and yet so far, because he could have said to Jesus, hey Jesus, have you not noticed what I have done for you? I've opened my home to you, Jesus. We've cooked a great feast for you and your disciples. And Jesus, I don't know if you've noticed, but there are people out there who are criticizing me for hanging out with you. Jesus, and, and now you judge me on this one thing, just this one thing, that I have not kissed your feet. And Jesus says exactly that. You can, people, get a whole bunch of other things right, but if you miss this, the other things mean nothing. And so don't miss this. In fact, I've got to give a, I have to draw something. So I'm just going to put a little question mark down here. What is that one thing? What is that one thing that you need to do to show Jesus that he is number one? What is that one thing that you need to do to be that kiss on Jesus' feet? What is that one thing? And if you do that one thing, let me tell you, a whole bunch of those other things don't count at all. They don't count at all. Because you've given Jesus what he wants. He wants that kiss of deep worship and deep intimate affection with you. And we're going to talk a lot about what that looks like. You know, the rich young ruler, Jesus said to him, you've got a lot of stuff, eh? And you've done a lot of good things. But the one thing you lack, sell all you have and come and follow me. That would have been his kiss of final worship. But he just 
couldn't do it. He would have said to Jesus, Jesus, I've obeyed the Lord. Jesus, I've given my tithe. Jesus, I've supported the people. Jesus, I've been kind to them. Uh, and, and Jesus would have said, yeah, that's really cool. Well done. Well done. But there's one thing you lack, is that kiss of worship. Sometimes the things we don't do are more influential, more impactful, and more important than the things that we do do. We'll talk about that. There's one more to go. Matthew chapter 26 gives us this final kiss. It's very similar to the one I've just told you about. It's the, the kiss of beauty. That's a jar. It's a jar that Mary used in a very similar scenario to the one we've just spoken about. Just before Jesus is about to be crucified, um, the, he meets in this house, and Mary, uh, the, the sister of Lazarus and of Martha, she came to Jesus and she said, Jesus, I want to pour this all over your feet. And she did that. Again, the disciples mocked her. Judas, the one who was over here, he was the one who's talking about money all the time. And he said, hey, hey Jesus, could we, we, could have, we could have used that money. What a waste, Jesus, that she would not be sell that so that we could, we could use that money to feed the poor. <laughs> Jesus said, you're always going to have the poor with me. He said, but this could be a better way of doing this thing. This was not the best usage of that money. And Jesus said, you may be right. It wasn't better, it wasn't best, but it was beautiful. We've said that before, have we not? A beautiful act of what sacrificial giving. It's, ex it's, ex it's extraordinarily, it's beautiful. And when Jesus sees this extravagant worship, he says, now that's what this is all about. And he says of this woman, he says, what she has done to me today will be a lasting legacy of her. They'll be talking about her thousands of years down the line because of a beautiful sacrifice, extravagant sacrifice she's made toward me. Let me tell you people, I don't want to be too, too, too much of a salesman here, but if you want to leave a good legacy, I've got to ask you, what beautiful sacrifice have you made? Because a great legacy is all about beautiful sacrifice. That people will be talking about you thousands of years down the line. Maybe not. Maybe two weeks down the line. But because of the beauty of the sacrifice that you have made on behalf of Christ. Her sacrifice was total. She broke the bottle. Her sacrifice was unbelievably extravagant. This was a year's wages. And she poured it all over Jesus. And she kissed his feet. That's a great, that's extravagant worship. That's bold worship. That's no worship. And this is extravagant worship. I'm done. Let me just tell you quickly. We've covered a lot today. And each one of these aspects is the stuff that we're going to be unpacking for the future. So I can't wait for church. Take you on this journey that we call the kisses. And there are others that we will add to this. But just as we close our service today and as the worship team come up here, um, maybe we need to take a, a moment of, just of reflection, just to recap and say, God, you've given me life. You've given me life. I need to be reconciled to you. I need to burn up the past. I don't want to kiss with feigned affection. I want to have total allegiance to you. I will not want to betray you. I want my worship to be bold. I want my worship to be substantial. And I want my worship to be completely beautiful at the end of the day. Think about that this week. Thanks, guys, for listening to me. Let's pray. Lord. Thank you that you kissed this guilty world with love. You initiated that kiss of reconciliation for us. And I pray, Lord, that we would respond in a great way. Thank you for today and a reminder of what life is all about. I pray that you would be pleased with us in these coming days as we respond to you, as you reach out in deep, intimate compassion toward us, and you be pleased with us in Jesus' name. Amen.